الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters to this uh, Friday evening program in which we hope to talk briefly about uh, the first 10 days of the Hijjah, the blessings of these days, the virtues, excellence of these days, and how best to spend these days and to make the most of these uh, days. So the first thing I wanted to mention was one of the blessings that is enjoyed by this Ummah Ummati Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us mawasim. He's given us seasons, periods of time, parts of the year which he has blessed and made the acts of worship which are performed therein more virtuous and more worthy of reward. He will give a tremendous amount of reward, a multitude of reward for a deed that if it were performed at another time of year would not receive the same type of reward. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this is because the a'mar, the lifespans of the followers of Muhammad والسلام, the people of this ummah, these lifespans are much shorter than those from the previous ummah, the previous nations. So, for example, take the Prophet Nuh Noah. We know that Noah preached to his people for 950 years, but he lived longer than that. Some of the scholars say he lived to be 1,050 years. Some people say 1,020 years. Some scholars say 1,400 years. Some scholars say he lived for 1,650 years. It's a tremendously long lifespan and a tremendous amount of opportunity to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gain good deeds. Especially when you compare that to the A'mar, the lifespans of the Prophet's nation, which he said would average around 60 or 70 years. So how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make up for that difference and make it possible for us to achieve rewards on par with those who preceded us who lived um, much longer than we did. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does that is by giving us these bawasim, giving us these seasons, like the season that we're currently in, the season of the first 10 days of the Hijjah. And these days are tremendously uh, blessed, they're tremendously virtuous, and they are in fact the best days of the year. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he designated for the Prophet Musa salam, a period of seclusion and the original designation was 30 days then he added I'm sorry 30 nights and then he added another 10 nights and the scholars of Islam have mentioned that the 30 nights were the 30 nights of the Qiyadah and then he added 10 nights and those 10 nights were the first 10 nights of the of the Hijjah and that period of seclusion that Musa spent speaking to his Lord and being taught by his Lord um, concluded fi ashr dil hijjah the 10th day of the hijjah yawm al-nahar and that was the day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Moses and so it is a virtuous day an nahar yawm al-nahar it is also the day where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he completed and perfected the faith of Islam as we know it today, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet or revealed to the Prophet on Yawm al-Nahar, Al-Yawm akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa radita lakum al-Islam adina. He said, this day I have uh, completed my favor upon you, I have um, perfected your religion for you, and I am pleased with Islam as your faith. And so these are some of the indications or some of the, um, yeah, some of the indications of the virtue, the merit, the superiority of this great this great season in which we're in the first 10 days of the hijjah al-masruq one of the great scholars of tafsir he said wa layali ashr hi ashr dil hijjah wa hi allati wa'ada Allah Musa wa hi athra ayam as-sana he said the 10 nights are the first 10 of the hijjah they are the same nights appointed by for Moses and they are the best days of the year and this is further supported by the hadith 
Asluhu fil Bukhari, which was originally uh, collected by Bukhari, and it's also been collected by Ahmed on the authority of Ibn Umar, and at Tirmidhi on the authority of Ibn Abbas, and in the hadith, the Prophet sallam, he said, Ma min ayyamin al amalu salihu fihinna ahabu ila Allah min hadi al ayyam al ashir. Faqil lahu, wal al jihadu fi sabilillah. Faqala sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, wal al jihadu fi sabilillah. So he said, there are no days during which the performance of good deeds is more beloved to Allah than these ten days. He was asked, not even jihad in the way of Allah. He replied, not even jihad in the way of Allah. And so these are days in which we should be keen to do as much good as we can to get closer to Allah and to earn some of the rewards that are there to be had in this season which are not there to be had in any other season from the seasons of the year. So what should we be doing? Um, obviously, some of the things that we should be doing, we mentioned uh, last week toward the end of the khutbah, we'd like to reiterate those there and add a couple more uh, as well. So one of the things that we should spend our time doing in these days is fasting. And it is highly recommended according to Jamahir al-Ulama, the, the vast majority of the scholars, past and present, that one of the best deeds to do during these first nine days of the Hijjah is fasting. And a lot of them support that um, position or stance or that opinion with the Hadith of Hunayda, collected by Ahmed and Abu Dawood and the Nasa'i, in which the Prophet ﷺ was reported, I'm sorry, on Ba'di Aswaj and Nabi, that some of the wives of the Prophet said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ سَلَّمْ يَسُومْ تِسَعْ ذِي الْحِجَّةِ that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to fast. He was in the practice and the habit and custom of fasting the first nine days of the Hijjah. And in Nawawiyu, he said in the Sharh of Sahih Muslim, he said, هذه التسعة مستحبة سيامها استحبابا شديدا لا سيما التاسع منها وهو يوم عرفة. He said, fasting these nine days is highly recommended and extremely encouraged, especially the ninth of them, which is the day of Arafah. Now recently when I mentioned this, um, I had a discussion uh, with one of um, the beloved brothers who I've known for a long time, in which he mentioned that there are some scholars who question the authenticity of the Hadith of Hunida. They question the authenticity and they say that there are some versions of the Hadith um, which seem to contradict other versions. And a hadith like that is called muttarib. It is called a hadith which is, um, I guess, for lack of, a better word, lack of a better word, translation, shaky. And this shakiness and confusion in the narration of the hadith makes it a hadith which is inauthentic. And therefore, um, they question whether or not fasting on the days of the first, I'm sorry, the first nine days is actually an authentic sunnah. They also mentioned the hadith mentioned by Muslim, I'm sorry, collected by Muslim authority of Aisha, in which she said, Ma ra'aytu nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sa'iman al-ashir qat. She said, I never saw the Prophet sallam, fasting the first 10 days of, um, of the hijjah ever. She said, I never ever saw that. So based upon this, some uh, people question whether or not fasting on these days is uh, acceptable or not. And so the response to this um, that the scholars have mentioned as far as the, uh, the ta'arul, the seeming you know, contradiction between the statement of Aisha and the hadith of Hunayda and also the ittirab that is in the hadith of Hunayda, the first answer they give, or one of the answers that they give, they have many answers to that, is that they say that it is not necessarily necessary that the Prophet Sallallahu has to do an action in order for it to be considered virtuous, mustahab, or order for that action to be virtuous and something which um, garners reward. That there are instances where the Prophet will recommend something to his ummah and he himself will not practice it for one reason or another. Like how the Prophet Sallallahu he encouraged some people to fast the fast of the Prophet Dawood 
which is to fast one day and to abandon fasting the following day. So basically to fast day on, day off. The Prophet ﷺ called that the best fast, the most superior and virtuous form of fasting. But he himself didn't practice it, but he recommended it and praised it and encouraged other people to practice it. So it's not necessarily necessary that the Prophet has to practice something in order for it to be virtuous and meritorious and to garner reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the first, or one of the first answers the scholars give, is that even if Aisha says that the Prophet never fasted it, we have the hadith of Hunayda, if it is accepted, regarded as acceptable, that shows that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged people uh, to fast, or that, I'm sorry, it, I'm sorry. We have the statement of the Prophet, which is indicative of the fact that fasting on these days is encouraged. What statement is that? That is the general statement of the Prophet ﷺ and the hadith of Ibn Umar and the hadith of Ibn Abbas, which we mentioned shortly a few moments ago. مَا مَنْ أَيَّامًا الْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ فِيهِنَّ حَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ هَذِي الْأَيَّامِ الْعَشَرِ He said there are no days in which doing good deeds is more beloved to Allah than these days. So the Prophet in this hadith is encouraging the Muslims to do what? To do good deeds in these days. And certainly fasting is one of the best deeds, as we see in the hadith of the Umama in which the Prophet was asked, Ayu amalin afdal, which is the best of deeds that a person can do. And the Prophet said, Alayka bisawm fa innahu la idla la idla lahu. He said, take to fasting. Make it your regular practice to fast because there is nothing which can equate to it. It has no equal. It has no equivalent. So when you look at the whole issue, if you t just take a step back and look at the whole issue from a holistic perspective, we see that we have the hadith of Aisha where she says the Prophet didn't fast. We have the hadith of Unaida which says that he fasted. Some people accept the hadith of Unaida, some people don't accept it. Let's take the hadith of Unaida and throw it to the side. We have, and let's take the fact, let's just take the statement of Aisha on face value and say the Prophet never fasted. Fasting these days in order to be virtuous does not need to be supported by the action of the Prophet as long as it's supported by his statement, and it is supported by his statement, which is a general statement in which he encourages us to do good deeds, and certainly fasting is one of the best deeds a person can do. So I say all that to say that fasting is something which is virtuous, which is recommended, which is highly encouraged for us to do in these days, and this is the opinion of Jamahir al-Ulama, the vast majority of the scholars, among them, uh, an nawi rahimahullah ta'ala, who speaks strongly in favor of fasting in his Sharh of Sahih Muslim, and also many contemporaries have argued very convincingly as well. Tayyib, uh, another good deed that we should be very, very keen to do uh, in these days is fasting, particularly the day of Arafah, the ninth of the Hijjah. So it may be the case that someone, uh, for whatever reason, is not able to fast all of the nine days, or even the majority of them. There may be some circumstance that prevents them from fasting these days. But of all the days, we should be keen to fast the ninth because of the specific virtue attributed to it by the Prophet ﷺ in the Hadith, in which he said, Siyamu yawmi arafah. أَحْتَسِبُ عَلَى اللَّهِ أَنْ يُكَفِّرَ السَّنْ لَتِي قَبْلَهَا وَالَّتِي بَعْدَهَا He said, for fasting the day of Arafah, I expect that Allah will expiate the sins of the previous and the coming year. This hadith was said by Muslim. <clears throat> uh, so in this hadith, the Prophet specifically mentions that there is a specific virtue for fasting the day of Arafah, and that is that the sins of the previous year and the coming year will be expiated. And this is something that we all are in need of because the Prophet clarified to us in the hadith of Anas, Kullu bani Adam khatta. Every human being makes mistakes and commits sins. We're all sinners and we're all in need of having those, having our record of sins expunged. And how can we do that? Through deeds like this, seizing opportunities like this, doing a deed that because of it, our, our sins will be expunged, will be wiped from our record, and our slate will be what? Will be wiped clean. 
And so this is another virtuous deed that we should be very keen to do on the 9th of Dil Hijjah, which will be, inshallah ta'ala, this coming Thursday. Next Thursday, inshallah ta'ala, this, I'm sorry, this coming Thursday will be the day that's July the 30th. That will be the day, inshallah ta'ala, based upon the moon sighting, when we should be fasting and uh, observing the day of Arafah with fast. Okay, but another deed that we should be keen to do during this time is a takbir uh, specifically, saying Allahu Akbar, and saying the formulas specifically designated for takbir in this time. We'll talk a little bit about that shortly. As well as dhikrullah umuman, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in general. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he said about these days, these uh, 10 days of the first 10 days of the Hijjah, he said, وَالتَّحْمِيلِ He said, so make it a point to repeatedly recite La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, and Alhamdulillah in the first 10 days of the Hijjah. And he also, in the hadith of Bukhari, uh, Al Bukhari, he narrates, وَكَانَ ibn Umar wa Abu Huraira. يَخْرُجَانِ لَلسُّوقِ أَيَامَ الْعَشَرِ فَيُكَبِّرَانِ فَيُكَبِّرُ النَّاسِ بِتَكْبِيرِ بِتَكْبِيرِهِمَا That Al-Bukhari he narrated that Ibn Umar and Abu Hurairah, following the command and the recommendation of the Prophet ﷺ, they used to make it a point to go out to the market during the days of the Hijjah, the first ten days of the Hijjah, and they would make the takbir, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd, and the people would what? Would be motivated and encouraged and reminded by their takbir and they themselves would begin to make a takbir such that the market would be what? Would be full and would, would, would resonate with the sound of what? Of the takbir of Ibn Umar Abu Huraira and the people responding in kind. Uh, that said, we should understand brothers and sisters that there are two types of takbir. The first type of takbir is what we call takbir mutlaq. It's a takbir that doesn't have a particular occasion uh, or event that it is associated with. A takbir al-mutlaq. And this is the takbir that we're supposed to be doing in these days. So as we're going to work, driving into work, returning from work, going to the store, standing in line, waiting to be checked out in the store, right? In our houses doing chores. Throughout the day, we should make it a point to fill our day with takbir. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, kabira, ila akhirihi. There are different siyag, there are different formulas that we've been taught and have been transmitted to us from the Prophet's companions or conveyed to us by the Prophet's companions. Any one of those siyag, we should what? We should actively be doing this takbir mutlaq during these days. The second type of takbir is what we call takbir at takbir al muqayyid The restricted Takbir, and that is the one which is specific to a certain event, and that event is the completion of the obligatory prayer. And so once we enter into the days of Eid and the days of Tashriq, the uh, three days following Eid, those are the days where we are supposed to confine our Takbir to the completion of the obligatory prayers. And so after every obligatory prayer, we should be making the Takbir until uh, or com completing that with the um, Asr prayer of the last day of Ayyam at Tashriq. That will be the last prayer after which we'll make the Takbir. So these, um, this is what we mean by Takbir in these days, the Takbir al-Mutlaq, which is what we should be doing right now in all occasions. Every opportunity we get, we should be making a Takbir. And then that'll be followed starting with the day of Eid with what we call tak Takbir al-Muqayyid, which is what we do following each obligatory prayer, or following the completion of each obligatory prayer. As far as dhikr Allah, this is every type of dhikr and form of praising Allah and extolling Allah is something we should also be busy with during these times. That can include um, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. It can include all the types of dhikr that we've been taught by the Prophet we should be trying to make those um, different form, recite those different formulas of dhikr in these days. But if another important deed that we should try to practice is reciting the Quran and praying at night. Reciting the Quran and praying at night. Um, that obviously one of the best deeds a Muslim can do is recite the words of Allah. No, in fact, the best form of dhikr, as mentioned by Nawiyu bil ijma' 
uh, uh, and he transmitted the, the unanimous agreement of the scholars regarding this, the best form of dhikr is the Qur'an, reciting the, book, the words of Allah. How can you remember Allah with anything better than His words? So reciting the Qur'an is something we should definitely try to do as much as we can in these 10 days. In addition to that, praying at night. As was mentioned by Sayyid ibn Jubair, he said, لا تطفئوا سرجكم ليال العشر He said, do not extinguish your lamps during the first ten nights of the Hijjah, meaning, spend these nights in prayer and recitation of the Qur'an. Finally, brothers and sisters, from the deeds that we should be trying to be keen to do uh, in this month, uh, there are many others, and I'll mention them على Ujala. Uh, for example, one is repentance. And this is a deed which is virtuous at any time, at any place, but it is definitely even more virtuous in these uh, 10 days. Days in which a person should um, make a muhasaba. A person should account, take an account of his or herself. And look at the things that they've done and said and how they behaved. And bring themselves to account before the day comes when you are brought to account. Right? Repent before the day comes when you can no longer repent. Uh, something which goes hand in hand with repentance is seeking Allah's forgiveness, saying lots of istighfar. Uh, also, reconciling between Muslims. You know two Muslims who are not speaking to each other, who are not on the best of terms. This is a good opportunity to make what we call islah that al bain that basically you bring two people together and reconcile between them, uh, command the good and forbidding the evil, uh, helping the needy and less fortunate and giving charity and this is uh, one that I would like to spend a little time on uh, before closing and just say that uh, obviously one of the best and most virtuous deeds that we can do as Muslims is be giving, be generous. The Prophet Sallallahu it was from his example to be extremely generous as Ibn Abbas said, as Khalid al-Bukhari he said, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه أجود الناس he said the Messenger of Allah was the most generous of people and he would be particularly generous in these mawasim, in these seasons, like in Ramadan and also in the Hijjah. This is an opportunity because of the mudaaf uh, al-ujur, how the deeds, the rewards for the deeds are multiplied in this time. This is an excellent opportunity for us to give in charity, to increase the reward that we receive from Allah from the charity that we give. And obviously there are lots of good causes that people can give to. And um, we are free to give to any good cause, any acceptable um, avenue um, of good and uh, khair. But if I um, could take the, I guess if I could um, be at liberty to make a suggestion. And I would suggest um, that you consider giving to Al-Yemen. Um, there's a lot that's going on in Al Yemen which is just not talked about. There's just very little media covered coverage, and we hear very little about what's going on in Yemen. But the people there are suffering uh, tremendously. Obviously, um, among the descriptions that have been given to the current state in Yemen is that it is described as the world's worst humanitarian crisis. That of all the world's crises. And Yemen is considered by some to be the worst of those crises. As we know, the country has been recently ravaged by war. In addition to that, it is an extremely poor country. And because of that poverty, more than 20 million people are at risk of famine and starvation in that country. Uh, child, mal child malnutrition is a huge problem in El Yemen to the extent that half of all Yemeni children under the age of five are stunted. They are stunted because of the extreme malnutrition that's going on in that country. Add to that the outbreak of COVID-19 and how this poor country, war-torn country, a country where it's very difficult for them to get food and supplies, etc., is now in addition trying to deal with this pandemic and unable to get the necessary medical supplies and other tools needed for prevention 
and treatment of those who have been afflicted with the disease. And so for this reason, I am humbly recommending and suggesting that if you're going to give charity in these 10 days, as you should, that you consider giving some of your charity or a good portion of it to the people in Yemen. There are a lot of good organizations out there who are working in Yemen and who will take your donation and will put it to good use in Yemen. Uh, I'm not going to plug any one of them. I will leave it to you to select the organization that you trust. But I would recommend that you um, look into, strongly consider in these 10 days, what remains of these 10 days, to give charity to Yemen. I also want to say that, um, generally speaking, uh, charity begins at home. As the Prophet, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Hadith, Ibda bi nafsik, he said, begin with yourself. You know, begin with, with at home, right? And so, um, as you consider giving charity and consider your options of where to um, spend your charity, who or to whom to give, don't forget about your local communities. Um, obviously, because of the COVID-19 outbreak, because of the suspension of services, because of the limited um, offering of services um, to protect our congregants, donations are down. But the expenses of maintaining the masajid do not go down. Those expenses remain the same. And so therefore, it is uh, very important uh, that we as community members, we don't forget about our masajid. We don't forget about our communities. And that during these days, as we're looking for places uh, to donate, we're looking for um, opportunities uh, to give in the way of Allah, certainly giving to your local masjid and helping the masjid uh, in its uh, pursuit of funds to, um, to maintain the masajid and to cover um, operational costs. This is a good, uh, definitely a good avenue to seek to spend in. So perhaps you can give uh, some of what you intend, you designate and set aside for charity. Give some of it to the people in Yemen, for example, and give some of it to your local community. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who he teaches beneficial knowledge. And who he truly benefits from the knowledge that he teaches us by making us from those who put it into practice. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakan nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.